Good morning or good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our webinar, Stem Cell Derived Exosome Production in Steel Tank Bioreactors. This webinar is part of our virtual event, Eppendorf Planet of Knowledge, here on Leopard. Following the webinar, take your time and have a look at our event platform and discover more content and workflow solutions for your research. My name is David Wolbach, the moderator of today's session, and now let me introduce to you my colleagues Aurelie and Roche, who will present their work on exosome production in steel tank bioreactors to you. And with this, I will hand over to Jorge. Yeah, thank you, David. Uh, hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar entitled Stem Cells Derived Exosomes Production in Steel Tank Bioreactors. Uh, this is the agenda we prepared for you today, and we divide it in three main topics. First, I will, uh, the introduction, I will discuss about exosomes as a promising cell free therapy tool. Then we will discuss about the challenge behind the exosome production process. The second step process, uh, uh, we will describe about process development in dust box mini parallel reactor system. And then at, at the end, I will explain the exosome production on Siberia twin by reactor control system. Yeah, as everybody knows, stem cell therapy, also known as regenerative medicine, is designed to repair damaged tissue in the human body by implanting new adult stem cells, modulating the immune system, and reducing inflammation. The premise of stem cell uh, the cell therapy is to help the body to heal itself, increasing the quality of life, of life for patients. So you can see here more than 5,000 clinical trials have been produced for different uh, uh, applications. The global stem cell market uh, is very competitive uh, nowadays, and it's estimated to reach around $146 million by 2024. This market is fueled to the therapeutic action of stem cells for several disease treatment and because of the stem cell line banking. In addition to that, the development of induced polypotent stem cells, IPSC, also has contributed to the growth of this market due to the social ethical issues associated with embryonic stem cells. As you can, you can see here in the picture of the musculoskeletal disorder segment, during the global stem cell therapy, but unfortunately, clinical trials uh, have uh, made only a modest improvement in restoring normal functions to the regenerative tissues. Uh, in the earliest day, the mechanism of action of the cell therapy claimed that cells implanted should integrate in the site of injury, replace the damaged tissue, and improve tissue and organs. However, limitations associated with cell localization and cell survival in the target tissue works again tissue generation. But the real question here is, do we have the right tools to address, this, to address the cell uh, therapy limitation? Let's go through that. Extracellular vesicles, including exosomes, are one of the most important paracrine effectors involved in the intercellular communication. Uh, they were discovered more than 30 years ago, and they were considered as cellular waste uh, disposals. Uh, Think of an exosome as an embryo with instruction inside, like one cell mailing a letter to another one, telling it what to do. In this case, the envelope, that is the exosome cargo, contains microRNA, non coding RNA, and a lot of proteins. They are released from different types, uh, such as T and B cells, mesenchyma stem cells, tumor cells. As I mentioned before, they mediate inter and intracellular communication when they are secreted in the bloodstream and also they mutilate the immune regulatory processes, set up tumor scale mechanisms and mediate genetic or the, the genetic process. Uh, they have also a round shape morphology and they are present in a variety of body fluids such as blood, urine, amniotic fluid, synovial fluid, etc. The cell secretome consists of extracellular vesicles, specifically exosome, microvesicles, membrane particles, peptide, and small proteins. So you can see here, uh, uh, we should this, this picture because we have you know, uh, a comparison between them, but you know, exosomes are lipid bilayers vesicles with a diameter range in between 50 and 100 nanometers, and also they can be easily confirmed by sulfurous markers such as CD9, CD3, CD81 of 
Okay, there are some. Yeah, but not all the missing primates derived stem, uh, uh, stem cell uh, derived exosomes are similar. Uh, the missing primate stem cells are present in, in different adult tissues, such as uh, alipon tissue, bone marrow tissue, umbilical core, uh, as well as uh, IPSC and embryonic uh, stem cells. And depending on the source, the exosome yield is completely different. So they offer several advantages compared to the cell based approaches including a section of stability and biocompatibility. Moreover, they can be delivered to target tissue easier than the whole cells, and they can migrate across the, uh, the blood brain barrier. According to the PubMed, and you can see here in, in the slide, the number of citations has grown more than 10 times in the last decade or so, they have gained importance. Today, this new cell-free therapy has had great impact in various fields of application, reaching 192 clinical trials worldwide related to exosomes that are listed in clinicaltrials.gov. So they have been used as drug delivery systems, as tumor biomarkers, and mesenchyma stem cell derived exosomes also have great potential in, in bone and cartilage regeneration. This figure shows the biotherapeutic particle history since 2006. So, um, as you can see here, in 2006 was approved the first cancer vaccine. Uh, Later in 2012 uh, was approved the first gene therapy, and in 2015 was approved the first oncologic biotherapy product. So, and now I will let my colleague Aureli to describe the challenge behind exosome production process. Thank you, Jorge. Now you have a clear view of what's an exosomes and their growing interest in the context of cell-free therapy. Nevertheless, uh, the exosome production process is still challenging. And um, the preclinical and clinical development of the exosome technology as a cell-free therapy or a drug delivery platforms require a large quantity of exosomes. It's really difficult to define a precise range regarding the optimal therapeutic dose. Indeed, this therapeutic dose will depend on the specific purpose of the study and on the way the exosomes are quantified. But you have here an example of the huge quantity of exosome which is required to be administered to an animal to achieve biological outcomes. So the mass production of exosomes is then a requirement to generate re uh, clinically relevant amount of exosomes. However, the mass production of exosomes presents several challenges. Indeed, you have to reach a delicate equilibrium between the quantity and the quality. And the final product must be pure, but also keep its bio biological property. The manufacture process uh, you have to use should be scalable, of course, but also have to be controlled, standardized in order to improve reproducibility. And finally, this process should be in accordance with the appropriate regulation requirement. So for the moment, the most current methods used to enrich, collect, and isolate exosomes are not fitting with those aspects. The exosome production workflow is a multi-step process and could be divided in three major steps. The upstream process here first, um, during which the cells used as exosome sources are, are expanded and also during which the um, exosomes are enriched in the cell conditioned medium. The second step is the downstream process, consisting in the isolation of the secreted exosomes from other elements contained in the conditioned medium. And finally, the quality control, which is based on the exosome characterization. And for all those steps, um, all those steps could be a, a source of variability and a challenge for the researcher. And for example, for the upstream process, the question of the researcher could be which exosome source to select or how to ensure an efficient cell proliferation and exosome secretion, how to deal and how to proceed to the in-process control. So before to go more in detail with the upstream process, which is the topic of today, I would like to 
briefly describe you some challenging aspects and key messages associated with the downstream process and the quality control. There is a large variety of techniques which could be used to isolate exosomes. Historical gold standard methods are based on ultracentrifugation with two main variations, either differential pelleting or using density gradient. But in a manufacturer point of view, the ultracentrifugation ultra based methods uh, present some limitation, especially because they are difficult to scale up. The process is often long, multi-step, and requires a high level of skill and expensive e equipment. So it exists a lot of different other techniques to isolate exosomes, such as size exclusion chromatography, filtration-based method, precipitation, or immunoaffinity uh, capture. Those methods present a better scalability, but all those methods present advantage or limitation, of course. Main, uh, here is, um, here is some, some important message to consider from, for uh, exosome isolation strategy and selection, especially in the transition from a bench scale to a clinical production of exosomes. So first of all, a very important message that is that for the moment, there is really a lack of stand standardization for the exosome isolation strategy. Nevertheless, the uh, isolation strategy you choose with will greatly impact the final product. So it's really important to keep this in mind. Another point is that often you, um, researchers will use combined techniques in order to improve the purity of the final product with a balance between recovery and specificity. And the choose of the technique, the choose of the strategy to combine together to, to, to isolate your exosomes will really, really depend on the final purpose. So that's the, once again the question of the balance between the recovery and the specificity. In a context of mass production of exosomes in a therapeutic pr purpose, the crucial aspects to keep in mind are, of course, scalability, respect of regulation, potency maintenance of the final product, process control, but also specificity and high efficiency in terms of yield, cost, and time. So it's really, really challenging. Regarding the exosome characterization, there is also a very large variety of methods used, uh, making result and analysis really difficult between uh, difficult to compare. Sorry, between uh, study from from a study to another. So some methods are based on physical properties, others are based on the um, presence of specific markers. Um, and recent review also highlight emerging techniques. But once again, there is some challenge, especially the standardization, the, the specificity, the sensitivity, and the throughput of those methods. And now we will focus on the first step of the workflow, so the, so the upstream process resulting an, in an efficient uh, exosome secretion. We would like to highlight key factors to address to improve and warrant a successful and reproducible upstream process. So as Jorge mentioned in the beginning of this introduction, not all uh, exosomes are the same. Not all uh, MSC-derived exosomes are similar. Uh, during, uh, it's really important to keep in mind that the cell culture parameters used to improve and to, to process the, um, the cell expansion will largely impact the quantity and the quality of the secreted pro product and the secreted exosomes. So any change in the cellular phenotype due, for example, to the adhesion process, the proliferation process, or to any potential uh, cellular stress occurring during this, this phase of the culture could, unwant, uh, could generate unwanted alteration in the composition and the function of all those exosomes has those two very interesting, uh, interesting articles um, describe. So of course, uh, you could consider um, different parameters which could impact. It could be the culture medium, the culture support, but also other physical chemical parameters. Regarding the culture medium, the idea is to push uh, an efficient and robust cell proliferation. Of course, to do that, we, we usually use growth factors, generally supplement in the medium as a fetal bovine serum. 
But uh, nevertheless, those animal-derived supplements contain exogenous exosomes, which could cause contamination in the final product. So exosome uh, collection could be then consequently performed differently, either, either using um, culture medium supplemented with exosome depleted FBS in order to reduce the, the, the potential contamination, take care that it's not a free of exosome medium, but exosome depleted, it will just reduce the contamination. Another way is to use a two-step process with the first phase, which is uh, which answer the cell expansion in a classical culture medium. As soon as you have obtained an, an optimal cell density, you will completely change the medium for an exosome collection medium, which is free of exogenous medium. In this medium, the cell will decrease the proliferation, but you will uh, use this medium for a reduced period of time just to collect the exosomes. Some commercial versions of those medium exist and are supplemented to increase the exosome secretion. Another important parameter is the culture support, especially in a scale-up process. So conventional 2D adherent cell culture support, such as flask or multi-layer flask, are limited in terms of growth surface area per volumes. So usually we go in the direction of the 3D culture, especially based on the use of macrocarriers to increase the cell density using a bioreactor. And this culture in 3D could offer uh, not, not only the advantage to be scalable, but also the advantage to be more physiological for the cells. And different papers have has already described the fact that the, the use of a 3D culture could improve the yield and the functionality of the secreted exosome. In the transition for the 3D culture, there is a lot of parameters that you have to to uh, optimize in, or, in order to ensure a robust attachment and a, an, uh, an efficient start of proliferation. Amongst those parameters, you could, of course, select the most appropriate type of carrier. The initial cell seeding density could also be optimized as the um, cell carrier density uh, ratio. And you could also optimize the first period of time in order to improve the adhesion with a reduced agitation, for example, or using a reduced volume. Finally, there is a lot of different physical chemical parameters which could impact your culture, and you have to take care to the pH, the oxygen tension, the temperature maintenance, the agitation, and of course the feeding strategy you will use. As an example here, in order uh, to be more physiological, you could be interested to reduce the tension of oxygen in order to be more physiological, mimicking the in vivo niche of the stem cells. And all those uh, parameters should be stable and more... Uh, sorry, could you mute? Thank you. Um, in this way, uh, the use of steroid tank bioreactors could be very interesting and offer you a lot of uh, advantage. Those uh, bioreactors um, allow you to process, um, to monitor and control your process uh, during all the, the entire process. You could um, really control and find the ideal condition, maintain those conditions during all the process, and nevertheless, uh, moreover, they propose a scalability option with uh, similar vessel geometry and capability at different size. So it's very interesting in, in this way. As a conclusion of this uh, introduction, um, we would like to insist on the importance of the standardization of the entire process through all this process, from the cell culture to the final characterization. And it's also very important to really describe in detail the material and method parts of the publication in order to be really reproducible uh, and to reproduce exactly the same condition. Um, in the next part of the, the presentation, we will introduce you the use of the DASBOX mini bar of parallel bioreactor system to develop an exosome production process in a small scale thyroid tank uh, bioreactor and optimize the culture condition before a potential scaling up. So uh, this first slide uh, describes here uh, the experimental strategy used for the upstream process. So 
MSCs derived from adipose tissues have been selected as an exosome source. After towing, the cells will recover a few days in a flask. The appropriate amount of cells have been seeded on microcarriers in a BioBlue single-use vessel. And the cell growth is then monitored during five days by the DASBOX systems. Growth factors are added three days post-seeding in order to, improve, uh, to ensure proliferation. Regular monitoring of the cell adhesion, but also the cell viability is performed during the expansion phase. After a five day of cell growth, the culture medium has been completely changed for a collection medium, which is free of exogenous exosomes. And the exosome enrichment occurred during two additional days at the end before harvesting and performing downstream process. Here are the main process parameters used during this upstream process. You have here the type of carriers and the quantity we have used, the inoculation cell density and the working volumes. Importantly, we have note here the cell carrier ratio and the dissolved uh, oxygen percentage, which, which correspond to a pressure of oxygen of 8%, mimicking the in vivo environment. We have also the pH and also information about uh, different parameters, such as the agitation. We have the agitation for, for the first four hours, and then the agitation was set at 100 RPM during all the process. Here are the first results. Cell viability was determined regularly during the process by staining with a fluorescent uh, calcine AM probe and visualized under a fluorescent microscope. As you can see, through the five days post-seeding, cells are growing progressively and form progressively small aggregates and 3D structure. The proliferation has also been evaluated through cell counting, performed at different time points during the process. So small samples of the cell suspension are taken from bioreactors and cells are detached with trypsins and counted with a vice cell automated cell counter. Uh, the results obtained confirm the efficient proliferation with a very short lag phase at the beginning. And the final density is not here. You have here the complete uh, the, um, the total number of cells in the vessels, which uh, and the fold increase we have obtained after five days. In the meantime, we have also checked the concentration in glucose and concentration in lactate, which are uh, liberated, liberate, is secreted in the in the culture medium, and those parameters also confirm that the proliferation is efficient. Now, here is the experimental process used for the downstream part. Uh, we have collected, of course, the self-conditioned medium. And this medium has been centrifuge, filtrate, and concentrate uh, using those parameters. A small sample is uh, uh, safe to perform particle size distribution analysis. And the rest of the volumes is loaded on a size exclusion chromatography column. We collect at the end 22 fraction, and the total protein content is also evaluated during all this process. At the end, every fraction is concentrated before to be submitted to exosome characterization. And in our case, we have selected to study the, the presence of the CD63 protein, a transmembrane. Uh, tetraspanin protein, which is specific of exosomes, uh, through uh, thanks to a NELISA approach, but also with a Western blot approach. Uh, negative control, it's really important, was also performed in parallel. It consists in a non-conditioned medium, so it's the, the collection medium without be uh, with no contact with the cells, and this negative control. Um, um, as follow exactly the same procedure, the same process than our conditioned medium. Here are the results obtained with the elute fraction uh, using the Elise and the total amount uh, count. So in blue, you have the total amount uh, uh, evolution uh, in all those fractions. 
and you can see that there is a peak here uh, on the on the fraction 20, 21, and 22. In parallel, we have also the result from the ELISA essay, and here you have seen that we have a peak uh, on the top of the fraction 18 and 19, with a maximum of quantity in the fraction 19 corresponding to 9 to 10 um, um, exosome quantity. We confirm this, uh, those results with the Western blot analysis, and here again we have a, an increase of the CD63 protein in the fraction from 16 to 20, with a peak at the fraction 18 and 19, 17 eight, till uh, to 19. Finally, uh, we uh, evaluate the size distribution of the samples we have collected through two different methods, the dynamic light scattering and the centrifugal liquid sedimentation analysis. Once uh, those two methods confirm that we have a population or a B-model distribution with two nearby population uh, at size ranging in the, the range of the exosomes. So to conclude this part of the presentation, we can say that the DASBOX mini reactors is a perfect tool to test and optimize the process at small scale. You can really uh, compare and test the influence of different culture parameters during all the process. It's really easy to compare. You, you could uh, monitor uh, every physical chemical parameters in a very stable environment in order to define reproducible parameters to reproduce at the end. So now I would like to let Jorge present another and different strategy in order to produce exosome in the side barrio. Thank you, Aureli. Yeah. Um, so uh, a different strategy will follow in this study. In this case, uh, as you can see here, we use BioLuan-C single use of vessels as bioreactor for uh, induced Important stem cells, the IMS and Kaima uh, stem cells, exosomes, uh, production, isolation, and characterization. We employ the Siberian twin by reactor control system as a control device and collagen code microcarriers as uh, so crucial support. support. The main aim in, in this study was uh, the production of exosomes using one liter scale as a model for large scale production in bioreactors. Um, to demonstrate the ability of IPSC derived mesenchyma stem cells to create exosomes, we performed two uh, medium exchange experiments in four steps, as the picture showed. Yeah, in the step uh, number one, a uh, detailed inoculation, the inoculation preparation. We used we use T flask culture conditions for the initial cell expansion and hyperflask in the third process to achieve the appropriate inoculation cell density. Then, uh, the stainless capacity of IPSC derived mesenchyma stem cells was analyzed by flow cytometry, noting that they display typical phenotype of mesenchyma stem cells, positive for CD90 and CD29, typical uh, mesenchyma stem cells market, and negative for hematopoietic markers such as CD34, and then for monocytes, CD. 11, 11B. So then, IPS derived mesenchyma stem cells were transferred into glass bottle containing the uh, collagen called microcarriers and cell coercion medium. In this case, we use two different kinds of media, NF12 and ATCC complete medium. Then we kept the bottles in the, in the incubator for two hours uh, under certain conditions, as you can see here. Yeah. On the other hand, prior to the preparation, uh, of the BioBlue 1C, uh, 1C single-use vessels, we perform a calibration of the pH sensor, and then we outfitted uh, each BioBlue, among others, with a deep tube, uh, along with a compressor probe uh, adapter, both inserted in the first PG 13.5 uh, port under aseptic conditions. Uh, I have to, I, I would like to highlight here that this deep tube was used to do the medium exchange. Following the, the incubation, 
Following the, incub the incubation, 300 milliliters of cells uh, on microcarriers were transferred into the BioLoo once the bioreactor already filled with uh, 700 milliliters of medium reaching the working volume uh, of one liter. Yeah. After day uh, five of cell corrosion, we performed the medium exchange every two days until day nine, and then daily basis as required. Uh, but how we did that? So we stopped the agitation and gas flow for five minutes, allowing the microcarriers um, uh, to settle in the bottom of the BioLu 1C and exchange 10% of the medium using uh, that deep tube to remove the cell culture of medium from the surface and using the feeding port to add fresh medium. Yeah. Um, after day um, five, uh, eight, at 11, uh, day five, eight, 11, and 14 days of culture, we collect 50 milliliters of um, 50 milliliters of IPS derived mesenchyma stem cells along with microcarriers and, and, and medium using a container bag with uh, line set. So we transfer that 50 milliliters into 50 milliliter conical tube uh, along with APSC derived mesenchyma stem cells and microcarriers to in the bottom. So then we remove that supernatant and added 50 milliliters more medium using the same component but in this case, replacing the FPS with 2% uh, of exosome depleted uh, FPS and then transfer into the, the shaking class. So finally, we incubate that IPSC derived mesenchyma stem cells uh, and microcarriers uh, for 48 hours under the same conditions. So then 48 hours after E collection day, as, um, as you can see here in this slide, um, we, we removed the supernatant and then uh, we performed the isolation purification uh, of exosomes according to the exoquist TC protocol with some modifications you can see here. So we collected samples every day in the course of the first experiment and every two days in the second experiment from bioreactors to determine that the cell viability, cell density, and metabolite concentration. So three milliliters were collected for analysis. Then these uh, a volume were transferred in, into the conical tube. So we washed with PBS and then we trypsinized the cells in order to detach the cells from the microcarriers and uh, do the, 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 the analysis. So later on, the cells uh, and microcarriers were filtered through a 40 micron strainer uh, in order to, to determine, determine the same viability and density. As you can see here in the picture, after the cell expansion, the cell count was erratic, especially after each collection day. So we attribute this to the low inoculation density and also because we use in the first experiment the demand F12 cell corrosion medium, whose composition probably won't be suboptimal for the IPSC derived mesenchyma stem cell expansion. Um, also, we perform a second experiment to increase the IPSC derived mesenchyma stem cells inoculation density and the exosome production yield for each sample. So to achieve that, we change the cell corrosion media. In this case, uh, we use ATC complete medium uh, and also we increase the inoculation cell density. Finally, we kept the rest of the conditions in the assays of, of the first experiment. As you can see uh, in picture A, uh, we observed, uh, uh, observed an initial lag phase 24 hours after the inoculation, followed by the steady increase of cell growth between day one and day, and day nine. So then the culture reached the stationary phase on day nine, followed by a subsequent decrease in the cell density until day 15. Uh, I have to, to add here that we observe a substantial microcarrier aggregation later in the course of the run. Therefore, uh, we base the cell count in the later stage, not only to the floating microcarriers, but only in the, to the floating microcarriers. So probably the average of the cell expansion in the basin must be higher. In addition, so we determine the consumption of glucose and production of lactate and ammonia. As you can see here in the pictures, exosomes are highly enriched in protein in which the transponents 
membrane, as I mentioned before, CD 63, 9, 81, and 82, play a key role in cell invasion, penetration, and fusion events. So we use a direct <coughs> enzyme link immuno uh, non sorbent assays, ELISA, specifically ELISA Ultra C66E kit, in order to quantify the exosome abundance. The results show that the number of iPSC derived mesenchymal stem cells exosome constantly increased from day five to day 16. So in addition, so also we found a direct correlation between cell density and secrete exosomes uh, during the whole uh, experiment. So it's only the three dimension, uh, dimensional cell morphology and quality include the microcarriers. We collect samples at day five and nine, as you can see here uh, in the picture, and then visualize them through the bright field image. So we evaluate the morphology of human IPS derived mesenchymal stem cells, demonstrating that, as you can see uh, in, in, in the picture on the left side, at the early stage of the cell group profile, a few cells attach on the microcarrier surface and progressively form inter microcarrier uh, cellular bridge and aggregates, as you can see, uh, day nine. So, it's well known that the 3D uh, cellular environment allows the cells to mimic the in vivo cellular behavior involving cell cell and cell extracellular matrix interaction and promoting cell signaling and proliferation. So, it has recently been reported that although the mechanism of, of exosome biogenesis uh, is still not well understood, findings suggest that the exosome secretion and molecular cargo can be altered but the cells microenvironment. So it's important to see, to study morphology. So finally, I would like to, to add that these various twin experiments are preliminary studies that have not yet been optimized to obtain the maximum exosome production levels. However, our observations can serve as a guideline for further improvement in missing camera stem cells that are exosome isolation, purification, and scale-up protocols. Thank you very much. Thank you, Aurelie and Jorge, for the presentation. For everyone, if you haven't done yet, uh, there's still time to submit your questions via the Q&A window. To give you a little bit of time to do this, I would like to show you in more detail uh, three of our products that we used for these studies. First, um, there's the uh, CellExpert CO2 incubator. You do not need to worry anymore to place your plates always at the exact same position because with our incubator we verified the uniform temperature throughout the whole system at 27 different spots so we really ensure that there's a homogeneous growth condition the second one um, orly talked quite extensive about was the dust box mini bioreactor system this is a perfect system that simplifies your process development. It's a fourfold unit, but it can be extended up to 24 bioreactors. And together with the possibility to uh, easily integrate third party analyzers and the combination with our powerful dustware software suite, the dust box is the perfect tool for the efficient process development. And last, um, the Saverio Twin, our newest bioprocess family member from the experiments and the results that Jorge did present. The twin controller already supports 19 different vessel variants and there will be even more to come in the future. The innovative pay drawer concept of the system allows you to be to easily adjust it for changing requirements in the lab. If you want to have more information on this uh, product, you just visit our uh, website appendoff.com slash I see now that there are a couple of questions. So I will start reading with the first one, and this is going to Hoche, if I see it correct. The question is, how do you ensure that you do not have exosomes from the growth media in your experiment? Oh, thank you, David. Uh, this is a good question. Uh, well, a critical uh, here has to be considered before exosome production. And, uh, and essentially, is the cell culture. So as you know, uh, um, other cells require medium supplement with C of FBS uh, in order to also attach it uh, in, in any surface. And uh, we had before, um, when we were designing this experiment, 
we, we certainly perform several preliminary studies to establish the best, the best conditions, you know. So one of them determine the median composition. So we use median with our FBS and median with, with different exosol-depleted uh, FBS. Finally, we found that 2% uh, uh, exosol-depleted FBS was sufficient to maintain cell viability in the ground. But, you know, this is one thing that uh, we, uh, we, have, we have to see in the future. We need more development in some portion uh, in order to, um, to use it for this kind of, of applications. Okay, thank you. The second question is focusing, um, yeah, is for Aurelie. Why are mesenchymal stem cells a common cell type used in clinical trials to generate extracellular vesicles? Since a few years, um, we know that the MSC secretome uh, paracrine uh, factors secreted by hemases uh, are described to play a very important role and have biological outcomes. Uh, it could be cytokine, chemokine, growth factors, but also EVs, uh, including microcarriers, uh, including, sorry, uh, exosomes. And EV derived from mesenchymal stem cells have been described to have a different potential, interesting effect. Um, such as increasing androgenesis and wound repair, uh, reduce myocardial ischemia reperfusion injury, uh, promote a large variety of tissue regeneration. So that could be the reason why the MSC. Is common. Thank you, Aurelie. The next question is for Hoffa again. Have you compared the results obtained by ELISA with other quantification methods? Uh, yeah, thank you, David. So yeah, we used three different methods by the, the exosomes in the preliminary study. We used the micro the CA holding SI to the total concentration and after after conversion. And then we used also a human CD six speed detection kit. Uh, excellent quantification using uh, the flow cytometry. And as I mentioned in the presentation, I use was the ELISA at 25 and because uh, this specific uh, uh, assay gave us better results and logical exosome production trend. Okay, I hope everyone could understand this and the audio connection is not too bad. The next, qua the next question is also for Jorge. Why did you use iPSC-derived MSCs and no other MS cell sources? Okay, this is a good question. So, as I mentioned before, one of the preliminary studies uh, that we did was, per, was the selection of the, the cell source. So, in, we, we did three studies in parallel. Uh, using adipose derived mesenchymal stem cells, bone marrow, <clears throat> stromal cells, and IPSC derived mesenchymal stem cells. But uh, what we saw in, in, in this experiment is that uh, using the IPSC, uh, I was able to get the highest yield of exosome uh, under our specific conditions. So, but it's good that, you know, this is a good example for our customers. So, um, we were we were not pursuing a, a particular um, cell source. We were able to, to use one and show the customer that uh, with our conditions, they can get a uh, you know, good uh, amount of exosomes and uh, also they can follow our, our protocols. Okay, great. Uh, is there a solution to just harvest the supernatant with the exosomes? Orly, uh, that one is for you. Okay, um, I would say that usually for the secrete cell-derived products, we could use fiber cell disc and packed bed bioreactors, which offer a nice opportunity to make easier uh, the collection of the final product. But um, with um, exosomes, it's, there is some, some difficulties uh, related to the medium composition and the presence of the exogenous exosomes in the medium. 
uh, as we have mentioned in the first question. Um, and so, as previously discussed, there is no perfect composition for the moment to promote in the meantime the cell proliferation very efficiently without exogenous uh, EV contamination. So we have to shift, shift, switch the medium for uh, EV collection medium, which is not so easy with a packed bed bioreactor. And which isolation system do you see best suited for the future to scale up the process? If I could continue, perhaps I could say yes, that please. currently <laughs> Uh, there is no perfect and standard isolation methods. Usually researchers use a combination of two techniques to improve the purity uh, and reach the balance between um, specificity and uh, efficiency. Uh, an interesting combination in terms of scale-ups could be the use of the tangential flow filtration first, followed by a more specific uh, affinity capture step. Yeah, if I can say something, that there is no standardized method that we can use right now in, in the market. So the best thing that we can do is to combine both in order to, to get a high pure subpopulation of exosomes. Okay, thank you. Um, the next question, I guess both of you can answer or have a different answer. It's uh, which microcarrier did you use for your experiments? Uh, yeah. Perhaps I can start. Um, it exists really a large variety of different carriers on the market and on the publication. There is no a perfect solution for MSC, so there is large different possibilities. Um, some carriers could be macroporous, mac microporous, non-porous. Some present some surface coating, such as collagen or Syntemax coated carrier to improve the cell adhesion. So it's not so easy to select. Um, so I think it depends on, on the cell type you use, um, but also on the medium composition. Um, for example, when you use synthetic medium or medium which are reduced in FPS, you could uh, you could use um, surface coated uh, carriers in order to improve the cell initial uh, adhesion on the carriers. So what, that's what we have done for uh, my part of the the, the experiment. Uh, we have used the Syntemax coated carriers. Yeah, so I use the coding code carriers. So they're good uh, uh, in cell support, especially at the beginning of the of the experiment when we we need that the cells attach as soon as possible uh, over the surface and and uh, avoid lag in our in our culture. So, and with the coloring code cards are good microcards to address uh, and to avoid certain limitation of cell, cell attachment at the beginning of uh, the experiment. Okay, uh, at the beginning of the presentation, you mentioned the increasing interest in clinical treatments. Jorge, can you give an example of exosome used in clinical treatment? Well, um, so uh, when I was uh, of course, my preliminary study, the, the, the study that I have been done, and then preparing this uh, webinar. So I have been reviewing, of course, a lot of literature. But then, then I found, you know, uh, right now, as, as, as everybody saw in the presentation, that there are many products in the market and many, and many clinical trials going on uh, right now. But uh, I would like to highlight one paper. Um, the paper is from um, Professor Giebel, a collaborator from the University of Essen in, in Germany. And uh, they use uh, mesenchymal stem cells derived exosome as a novel tool to treat therapy refractory graft versus host tissue. Uh, because mesenchymal stem cells are considered immunomodulating uh, cells. I mean, this, this is, is for the people who are not very familiar with, with that, is when you implant uh, donor a tissue from one person, and then uh, the, the 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 host tissue reject this uh, uh, allogenic cell that are implanted in, in in this patient. So normally, what uh, people use is uh, corticoids in order to reduce inflammation, allow the immune system to accept the, the the new cells. 
but basically they have been they use here exosomes with good results. I, I mean, if people want to read more information about that, I would be happy to share the, the paper. But uh, basically, at the end, they found that they reduce uh, the collateral side reactions uh, due to that disease, and uh, yeah, they explained that uh, they, they did that in one patient. And uh, they found good, uh, you know, they, they conclude that uh, the exosomes may be a great potential to, to, to reduce inflammation associated disease. I think this is one example, but again, right now we have many options in the market, many clinical trials going on. This is a new field, and I have hope that uh, many limitations associated with the cell therapy can be addressed using uh, the exosomes uh, or, or cell-free therapy as uh, people know uh, this field right now. There are really a lot of questions uh, on the list, but I think we have time for one last question. Orly, I will give this one to you. How to reduce the leg phase often observed after seeding in a bioreactor? Yeah, it's a good question, um, especially for people which are perhaps afraid by the transition from 2D to 3D uh, culture. Um, so, of course, the, um, the, the, um, the quality of the initial cells is very important. Uh, you have, of course, to use cells uh, very young. Uh, the successive passage, especially for MSCs, could induce progressive senescence and change in the phenotype and decrease in the proliferation uh, rate. Um, the carrier selection is also important. Uh, you have, we have already discussed this point, uh, but also other parameters like the initial cell seeding density and the so-called cell to beat ratio. So it's really important to, to optimize those parameters with your system. Uh, usually, we use a ratio of three to five cells per beat. Uh, it's recommended, but you you have to optimize this case by case and test with your cells and your medium. Um, another uh, recommendation could be to to really stop the agitation during the first hours uh, just after the seeding of the cells and work also with a reduced uh, working volumes during this short pe period. It could help the addition of the cells to the um, to the carriers and then a better start of the proliferation, a faster start. Um, this is an interesting parameter. Uh, yeah. Okay, thank you both for all the detailed answers. For all the questions that we didn't answer yet, uh, we will get in contact with you soon and write you an email with an answer to your questions. Thank you all for listening and enjoy the rest of the day. Bye. Bye. Bye.